Hey everybody, this is Palmer, and I am back today for Inquisitorial, not thoughts, but Inquisitorial Q&A, episode 6. Um, so, uh, it is July 3rd, so I want to wish everybody that's going to be celebrating July 4th a happy 4th of July tomorrow. Um, just got back from a Canada Day weekend, which is July 1st. A little under the weather today, um, so maybe I won't be as um, all over the place as I typically am, I don't know. Um, but... Um, was looking forward to kind of doing a Q&A and just working a little bit. Um, the, uh, I just finished watching Ian's unboxing of um, the American War of Independence uh, Liberty or Death set, which was really cool. I'm just getting caught up on some videos too. So um, what I'll be just sort of working on actually while we're talking is uh, just uh, doing some touching up on the white on this um, house that uh, I've been doing for musket and tomahawks. Um, I don't have that many questions this week, so I didn't even really print them off. I'm getting really uh, loosey-goosey with this because um, I have just only had like five questions, so I didn't even bother printing them out. So I'm just going to go in order that they show them on YouTube as I do this stuff. And um, thank you very much, everybody, that asked questions last time. I appreciate those that um, will put a question in for the next episode. Um, and so the first question is from Ralph Astley. Um, his question is, um, you mentioned Japan as a place you wanted to visit. I had a fantastic five-week holiday there in 1997. It's a great mix of modern and traditional with beautiful scenery. Um, talks about the cuisine. What aspect draws you the most? As I would imagine, it is a very different holiday to Hawaii, question um, mark. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mentioned, I think the question initially might have been from Richard Tattoo for you about what kind of holiday would you want to take with your wife and the thing, the reason that Japan came up is it was both a place that we were kind of interested in a little bit. Um, for me, I've always been a little fascinated with the culture. Um, in some ways, um, you know, like the traditional aspect of um, the old, you know, architecture and the houses and the temples and all of that kind of stuff I find really, really neat. Um, I like, and you know, some of this may be stereotypical, I apologize if it's not true, but I like the sort of real orderly and structured approach to society that often I get an impression of when I hear about and see Japan as well. Um, some of the cities, you know, with the, being a lot of the tech companies in Japan, there's this, I get this impression of really high tech, like seeing things coming out there first, you know, and things or things being tested first there. So there's almost like a bit of a clash between some of the traditional, like you were saying, Ralph, um, some of the traditional aspects and then um, some of the sort of high tech stuff and um, atmosphere maybe in the cities. Now, never having been there, like I don't really know and I don't really research it a lot. But um, it always just seemed like if I was to go out east, it, I didn't mention this last time, but this and this isn't one that my wife would necessarily want to go to as much, but I always had a, a bit of um, a fascination with Tibet as well, more from a spiritual component. And um, I, would, I wouldn't mind actually personally seeing Tibet someday. And um, I don't know, like I think that would be very different than Japan, but when I think about the east, two places that kind of come to mind is seeing Tibet for very different reasons and then also seeing Japan for a bit of a mixture of those. So yeah, um, yeah, I think that probably would be it. I also do um, like some Japanese cuisine, like I, I don't, I, know, I, I admit that I probably get a bit of a westernized version that um, may not be as hardcore. I don't know, like, I do like sushi and some of the various, you know, uh, sushi that I do try here in Canada. Um, but I don't know how authentic it is. But I do like it. And so, I wouldn't mind trying some other things. Having said that, um, I'm getting off topic here, but I have a thing against mollusks and eating mollusks. And then also, um, I'm not really into things with tentacles for the most part. 
and, it, and in all fairness, it's it's not um, necessarily a taste thing. It's more of a texture and just sort of, I'm, I'm a little grossed out by it. And so even though I've grown up in areas where you could get clams and oysters and things like that, I don't really ever want to put that in my mouth. Um, and as well, like octopus and like a lot of te like stuff with tentacles, I'm a bit of a baby about. And so um, when I say hardcore or whatever, and I, I eat sushi and I eat Japanese food, I realize that I have limitations. <laughs> I really like fish, like uh, ocean faring fish, lake fish, things like that. Like I do like lots of seafood, and I do eat lots of stuff like um, um, crab and shrimp and crustaceans and things. But I just I don't like for whatever reason. I call them I'm a bit anti mollusk. Um, so <laughs> sorry for going off topic there, but. It just sort of naturally flowed from it. So, yeah, I th so I think that's what it is, Ralph. Thank you for the question. Nick, Itik Beer, great Q&A, mate. Thanks for your thoughts on my avatar. Next question. If you could only build, build, paint, and play one system, which would you choose and why? There was a time when this question would be pretty easy. I admit, I actually saw this one come through and out of all the ones that I saw come through, and I try not to think about these too much, I was a little scared to answer this one. <laughs> what I mean by that is that it's kind of funny just because I don't like to commit to something, and then also just, in some ways, I'm sort of unsure in my head and my answer. But there was a time when the easy answer would be 40K, Warhammer 40K, because I love the universe. It will always be nostalgic for me, and I, I will likely always collect in play it to some degree. It's a huge part of my channel, uh, maybe not as much this last year. I do sort of dip back to it, and all of, for those that folks that watch the channel that I'm locally friends with, like most of them would attest to you that I always say, like, I'm always up for 40k, like that's usually my answer. I always say, even though I don't play a lot of standard 40k anymore, I, I prefer Kill Team actually more often than not. Um, I always um, tell people that I'm always up for it because it's true. Like I never really want to abandon it. I actually quite like 40k. Um, now to get to your question, Nick, I kind of thought about it, and my answer would probably be musket and tomahawks at this point. And I'll tell you what, like if it was purely just from a background perspective and it was between those two, it probably would be 40k just because of the diversity of the fictional background. And Musk and Tomahawks is just one era of history despite having a lot of background. Um, but 40k just has so much background. And if it came to the modeling component, it probably still would be 40k. But with the playing component, I'd rather really play Musk and Tomahawks at this point than 40k. Um, I like both of them and I want to play both of them, but I just find 40k for me has just gotten to the point where it's more to keep up with than I really want to bother with, to be honest. Um, now, in some ways that's unfair to 40k because I play lots of other games and if all I played was 40k and that's all I ever wanted to do, it probably wouldn't be too much to keep up with. But because I have other interests, it seems like that much more. Um, it's It just doesn't seem, you know, like... I'll give you an example. Like, I realize you don't have to use it or something, but, like, this latest... It's just one example. It's not my defining reason. But this latest book that's come out where you have to actually... Well, you use just for flyers. Like, you actually use these um, set of rules, and you can have these mini-games of flyers before the game even starts. You know, for me, it's just getting to be a bit much. It's It doesn't seem as self-contained anymore. And I find it, I find that a little unappealing as much as I love the universe. Um, some of you may or may not agree with this, but like the last year, year and a half, my love of the background of 40k and the models, and just in general, like the universe, has just made me defend in my head, like some of the reasons to continue with it. Um, and you find, I find that I do that like time and time again. And then finally it's like, oh, like, okay, I'm just gonna set it down for a while because it's just, 
I just find it difficult, honestly. I, I realize your question wasn't a defending your 40k thing, Nick, but it's the reason why it's not my only one I would pick anymore, I don't think. Um, and so I'm kind of sad that that's the case. But, and I, to some degree, I don't know if that it's gotten to this because you need that to maintain continual sales. I don't know if it's gotten to this because you need that to continually engage people. Because to some degree, if you let rules go stale, then you, you know, you have trouble continually engaging. There isn't just something new, always something new to learn, something to keep you engaged. Like, Musket and Tomahawks has been out, I believe, since 2012. It's looking kind of aged, and I've been the first one to say that it probably needs an update. But I still, like with that rule set, would rather, to some degree, just play that. I just find it... I like the rule set for completely separate reasons. There's nothing to compare between the two. But, you know, it is what it is. I know what it is. And, like, I'm not worried about a new codex or a new set of rules or something else. Now, I'm not going to go any further than that. Because I love both games. And I'm not stopping 40k. Um, I'll be doing it, whether it be through Kill Team, painting models playing some standard games, you know, I don't know that I'm going to be always on the bandwagon with the latest White Dwarf rules on something or formation, but I'll, I'll continue because I love it. But one thing I'll just mention is, as I was thinking about this, it's, it's way too soon to really be able to talk about Night Models Marvel Universe Miniatures game as being comparable to those two as a top tier game of mine, just because it's just come out, the rules are a little rough. But if I looked at background, like the Marvel Universe Miniatures game could very well vie for the top spot. Just because I love Marvel, like and I have since I was a little kid. Like it's a huge, it, it precedes 40k. Despite the fact that I did 40k in like the late 80s, you know, Rope Trader era was when I started. Marvel way preceded that in my lifetime, like as a childhood thing. And so I really identify with the mythology of the characters. Um, and I love it. Um... I, I'm enjoying it so far. I, I like a game where you play with a card that they release and um, it has like the, the individual attributes for the character on the card that comes in the blister pack and it's like special powers and it really it's like a new rule with each release in some ways. Each release has a power for a new character that can change the game a bit. I kind of like that aspect of Heroclix a little bit even though overall Heroclix wasn't really for me. Um, but I like that so far. I love the models. Like, I really do. I, I wouldn't mind resin at one point, but even though they're, they're metal models, they're still really nice sculpts. And so if the game can, is continually supported and they really continue to put out great models and bring out more factions, um, then really I, I could see that in some ways vying for a top spot. Um, as a game of mine, like, you know, as my, in my arsenal of games that I continually play and, and, and stay with. And I really consider 40k and Musk and Tumwalks to be part of that. Like, they're basically two that are cornerstones of, you know, I'm not giving them up. In some ways, I choose not to choose. I realize your question said, you know, if you were to choose, but I, in reality, I choose not to choose. Like, I'm never going to go down, most likely, to one game. Um, in my mind. Um, so, really good question, really thought-provoking. Primarily because I'm at a state in my 40k gaming where I'm really just not sure where it sits, you know, compared to everything else at this point. I would have always said it was number one in the past. And from a background perspective, it, I love it. Like, so, now I'm just starting to, through my tired rambling, um, I'm starting to repeat myself. Thank you, Nick, for the question. Um, Hellcare X. In one of your previous episodes, you were drinking a nice IPA ale. Do you have a go-to ale that you really enjoy and have in the fridge at all times? <clears throat> I wouldn't say that scotch I usually have an at all times bottle that I just replace like as soon as I empty it. But it's, Scott's a little bit, it, despite the fact that I mentioned in previous videos that I go through Scotch, it doesn't sit forever, I still do actually have like a, 
<laughs> a collection and it does sit there, you know, um, and it doesn't get drank right away. Um, whereas beer kind of flows right through my fridge. Um, <laughs> you know, it's into the fridge and out and then replaced pretty much, much faster than scotch. Um, I don't really have an ale or even a, well, I have a beer that is a, oh, okay. I don't have an ale that, um, you know, I'm making myself laugh here because I'm contradicting myself in my head. I, I, I actually do, don't have an ale per se, like a, and, and I love IPAs, um, but I don't have one that's always there. Now I do have s repeats, like, and one of them I may have shown on a previous video, but it's Sp Smash Bomb IPA. It's a, it's a Canadian one. It just has a lot of bite. I just quite like it. I do think that I'm, I'm a sucker for the marketing. Like, I think without even intellectualizing it, when I see the really colorful label and it's sort of really psychedelic looking, that I likely grab it on the shelf and because I know I've tasted it and liked it too, like it all kind of gets me to buy it. I'm kind of um, willing to admit that. Um, but um, that would be one that I really do like. One of my friends and I um, go to this place probably once every month or once every two months for a drink. And um, there's a company called Last Best and we're both really big fans of that as far as IPA. This particular place we go to actually have, um, they have a huge beer tap menu and they actually have a whole section on the menu just for IPA so they have probably between tw 10 and 12 just IPA ales on tap. And um, one of the reasons why we go there, because we just, and they, because they will kind of switch them out here and there too, and we both really like those. Now, having said that, um, in some ways I've come a little bit full circle in my drinking because um, since I was uh, in my liking of beer, um, because when I was a kid, like, I just, you know, I can remember a time when I didn't even know that they just had different kinds of beer. Like, you know, I would just drink whatever, you know, like Coors, Budweiser, whatever it was. I remember when Killian Red came out and there was a red beer and it was called Killian's Red and it was like, oh, I got to try that. And it was just such a different thing. Today, you can get everything from fruit beers to like every style of beer in the world and like just there's more beer than you can even imagine. Um, but back then, you know, like I remember when there wasn't really, there didn't seem to be much more. And um, I am... Um, to this day, I always like to have Coors Light in my fridge, just as sort of a refreshing thing, like when I'm mowing the lawn or whatever, like I like to grab just a regular commercial bulk Pilsner style beer. I still find a place for that. Um, it's not something that I'll, you know, that I sit back and savor like a nice micro brew, but that doesn't mean that I don't always have a place for it in the fridge just for, you know, something on a hot day to drink. So, so yeah. That would be, I guess I would just say Last Best on tap, um, Hellcorex, the, um, also the uh, Smash Bomb that I showed in that video as far as ales. But then, and they're, they're kind of like a couple of my go-tos. I never have them always in the fridge, um, but Coors Light I always have in the fridge. And then, uh, yeah, that's kind of my answer. Thanks for the question. Good one. So who is next? Um... I believe Smitty has one here. Um, na, 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 na. Maybe he doesn't. I think he, he provided some comments. Oh no, he does. If you had an opportunity to do this hobby as a full-time job, would you? Would you? Or would you take take the fun out of the hobby? Also, what job in the wargaming industry would you like to do if given the chance? Um, if I say no to the first part of whether I would, it kind of shuts down all the other questions. But, you know, like, I could, so I, I will answer the further ones, but I am going to start by saying that, um, I kind of thought about it a bit, you know, just because I spent a lot of time doing the hobby stuff, and I kind of, it, it has entered my mind, you know, what that would be like, what I would like to do. Um, some people might find that this crazy and some people might completely understand it, but I actually think that, similar for the reasons you just said, I probably wouldn't really pursue a job in the wargaming industry because I think it would take, uh, I, I think it would take away from my enjoyment of the hobby. 
and I'm not sure I'd really like it anymore. And then if all of a sudden I don't like it anymore, then it's just like another job. In which case now I've lost the thing I like to do when I'm at my job, and I'm also in a job that's now routine, right, you know, or something like that. And so some people may see it completely different, like, you know, some people, like, who are either beginning in that kind of work or, um, and have done it, or even folks that just have a completely different experience may say, I love it, you know, they love their jobs and it's a lifetime of fun. That's great. I, I think that's awesome. I've met people in other hobbies that have went into it full time and in the beginning like they were like oh like I love this and like particularly when they were kind of in on the upswing of it um, but later on like I've met in a number of situations where they've left it you know and then um, in some ways even weren't as active in the hobby anymore after that and so so I don't know I'm a little thinking that it probably isn't something that I would do um, if I was to be trying something new I'd probably be doing something completely different um, maybe something that's not as niche and something that more the general public um, would um, need, you know. Now, um, having said that, if I was to think about what I'd like to do if I was going to be in it, um, I can't really conceptualize at this point what I'd have to offer on a creative technical level that would be up to par from an industry perspective. So. In short, I don't think I'll be sculpting for the wargaming industry anytime soon. Um, I think it takes a lot of work and practice, and although I'm dabbling in it, I don't think I have the skill at this point to do that um, with the level of commitment I put towards it, and whether I am, or even if I put the commitment, whether I'd be able to would be um, a matter of, um, you know, we'll see, I suppose. <laughs> but. Um, and that's not really why I'm doing the sculpting, just, you know, to clear the air on that. Um, if I was to, so, so given that, given that my technical skills as an artist, I don't think, are of the quality to, to do that, um, what would it be that I would want to do, and what do I think I would like to? Well, I do have a business background in addition to some, um, some scientific medical sort of background as well. And I probably would, would like to see what it's like on the business side um, of supporting a game and trying to move that forward. As well, um, I do think it would be neat to work from a, a narrative perspective in the writing of the game and sort of like what it's based on, more of it in the writing side. Um, I, I also don't think from an artistic perspective I have the writing skills to do that, um, but I do think that would be kind of neat. Um, I think probably if I had to go with me today and what I have, I think it would be more I'd be interested on the business side and lending support. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I would do if I was to go into it. But in all honesty, um, it's not something I'm really planning on doing, like trying to, to go into the gaming industry. Um, yeah, good questions, Smitty. So, what else do we have? Richard from Tattoo For You. Um, have you ever, this is real, it's really funny how people, even like based on hearing the same discussion, in some ways their minds kind of, in some ways go from the last video to similar things. Not exactly the same thing. But Richard asked a different question, but it's not really unrelated to Smitty's. Um, have you ever wanted to or have ever created a game? Maybe you can use your own figures for the created, for, um, for the created rule set. And a non-hobby question. Where have you seen the most beautiful night sky? So, you know, like if I was to sculpt and be able to um, um, create a line of figures that could be used in a game, like I think that would be really fun. Like, it, it, you know, I think that would be awesome. Um, in some ways, doing the whole package of de developing the game, the rules, the background, um, the style of game, so like skirmish versus this versus that, the market aspect of what you're trying to sell and achieve for the type of gaming experience would be really neat. And the idea that you could, um, like Hawk War Games, I don't know how many of you guys know Hawk War Games for um, Drop Zone Commander, but I don't know the gentleman's name, but the guy that actually set that up in the UK 
it was really a one man operation initially, and he he did everything. Like as I understand it, he did the rules and the sculpting, and he did everything from the ground up and made it a success. And like my hats off to somebody that does that. My understanding it was is it was a tremendous amount of work, but um, he really showed himself to be a, a man of many hats. Like to be able to handle that from both an artistic side and a business side and make it all happen. And I think perhaps he, he actually has folks helping him now that he's made himself a success and the game a success with it. Um, you know, it's expanded and he's expanded. But really, I think um, that's a fun journey for somebody to go on. And I think that is really neat. I, I think that's awesome. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, but, um, you know, and I had, th I had thought about that in the past, to be honest. Um, but um, but for, a for various reasons, it's not something that I've devoted myself to. And it's not an idea that sort of made it past other things, you know, um, to, to kind of pursue. So, but no, I do think, Rich uh, Richard, that would be really cool. Um, where have I seen the most beautiful night sky? Well, um, I don't know if it was the most beautiful, but um, it's the most memorable for me for whatever reason. But um, I was doing winter backpacking when I was in college with some friends. And we went down to Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. I think it's Allegheny National Forest or Allegheny State Park. It's in western Pennsylvania. It's when I went to school in Buffalo. And it was during a, like a break, like a college break. And um, I remember just, it was winter backpacking, so we had like our tents on snow, and we were down by a lake, and uh, I remember looking up at the, the sky, and you are out there pretty much away from, at that time, you know, we're talking 1996 or seven. it's probably 1997, something like that, 96, 97, you definitely didn't have that much natural light from the cities, you know, in that sort of forest there, Allegheny National Forest, and so, because I know that always competes with your ability to see the stars and to do um, astronomy, but I looked up and it was beautiful, it was just, I just remember it was just so crisp and clear, and um, at that moment I just regarded just how well it was. Now, I also was just out in the woods and, you know, ad admiring nature to begin with, and so, whether that was the best one I ever saw or just the most memorable moment, you know, is um, all I can, I can't really speculate. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was amazing. And it was really, really, the time of the year, I don't know what the cold does, like, to the clouds and the ability to see stars, but it was, like, freezing outside, too. <laughs> we, you know, we had a fire, but it was just, like, um, really, really cold, and um, the the sky was pitch black except for you know the stars that you could see. There was really didn't have much interference of light, so it was amazing. That's an interesting question, Richard. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. I that's not one that I would have thought of asking, so that's pretty cool. Um, okay, everybody. So I am out of questions. So um, I I don't know if I had five or six, but I hope to have five a minimum of five questions. For each video because I, I have some folks and I really appreciate those that regularly ask and I have some folks as I said last time that just dip in with a question once in a while. If I get below five I won't be doing a video until it goes above five and if it doesn't then I won't do any more <laughs> because it's I do these just for fun but like if I don't have questions I'm not going to do them. Um, and so I appreciate I think I was a little above that this time so that's kind of cool. Um, ask a question if you're interested in painting along to these. Um, and uh, everybody that's watching this live, or not live, but sh close to uploading, happy Independence Day, and talk to you next month. Take care.